Good morning, everyone. We had a, a very active caucus meeting earlier today uh, as we acknowledge and mark the uh, one-year anniversary of President Biden's inauguration. Of course, there were three important Wednesdays in 2021. We had Insurrection Wednesday followed by Impeachment Wednesday. That was accountability for an out-of-control president. And then, of course, the third Wednesday of January of last year was Inauguration Wednesday. That was an incredibly important moment, recognizing, really, the arc of the American journey. We've got turbulence, uh, but ultimately, we always get through that turbulence, and it leads to triumph. And Joe Biden and Kamala Harris being inaugurated as the president and vice president of the United States of America was an affirmation of the rule of law, the transfer of power, even in this case reluctantly, and the robustness of American democracy. It's one of the things that gives us all hope, even as we navigate our way through the challenges right now in the Senate in trying to deal with the voter suppression epidemic that has taken hold all across America in the aftermath of the January 6th violent insurrection, you would think that my Republican colleagues, after seeing this Capitol overrun by people incited by the former so-called twice impeached president of the United States, the Capitol was overrun by Trump supporters who wanted to assassinate Speaker Pelosi hang Mike Pence, and hunt down members of Congress. You would think, in the aftermath of that, they would run toward democracy. Instead, they've run away from democracy. That's what's going on right now in the United States Senate as a result of Republican refusal to back the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Joe Manchin Freedom to Vote Act. Republican refusal to support common sense voting rights legislation that is supported by large swaths, majorities of the American people. Support for voting rights in America, which really should be bipartisan in nature at this moment, because in the aftermath of the passage of the original 1965 Voting Rights Act, voting rights in America has largely been a settled question, a settled question. So the question that we now are asking of our Republican colleagues, what happened? Because the original Voting Rights Act was reauthorized four different times. And each time the original Voting Rights Act was reauthorized, it was passed in this Congress with bipartisan majorities and signed into law by Republican presidents. 1970, Richard Nixon, 1975, Gerald Ford, 1982, Ronald Reagan, 2006, George W. Bush. Four times the Voting Rights Act has been reauthorized into law. Four times signed by a Republican president. And in 2006, the Senate vote was 98 to 0. 98 to 0. There are 16 Republican senators who voted to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act in 2006 who are still here. All you need is 10 of them. All you need is 10 of them. And we can have voting rights protections in place in the United States of America. So we're asking the question, and we'll continue to ask it, what happened to the modern day Republican Party? Was it the election that took place in 2008? Did that disturb you? Did that throw you off? Were you confused by that? Still trying to figure out how it occurred? What happened to the modern day Republican 
party that you've abandoned your own principles. Principles that Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Ronald Reagan, and George W. Bush espoused. And that 16 of you voted to authorize in 2006. What happened to the modern day Republican Party? It's a cult right now. Is it because the cult leader has told you to oppose voting rights? Vice Chair Pete Aguilar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things we also want to highlight is the work that House Democrats have done working with the Biden-Harris administration. Tomorrow marks the one-year uh, anniversary since President Biden and Vice President Harris took office. Weekly unemployment rates claims are down to levels not seen since 1969. We're the only economy in the world who, that is stronger today than before the pandemic began. President Biden rescued the American economy and he set a course for unprecedented economic revival if we are able to successfully beat this pandemic. On that front, the Biden-Harris administration is succeeding where previous, or the previous administration had failed. 200 million vaccines, 75% of adults protected. Teenagers and children across this country, including my own two kids, are vaccinated. 96% of schools are open today. The racial equity gap in vaccines has been closed. Just last week, funding for bridge repair under the bipartisan infrastructure bill was announced and more announcements are forthcoming. We will not stand by and watch the radical right sabotage our economic success and, and divert us from paying attention to what's important, which is voting rights and ensuring opportunity throughout this country. We'll continue to fight every day for the American people so we can deliver for working families. That's what House Democrats are committed to. Uh, that's what we hear overwhelmingly from our colleagues of what we should focus on. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. Questions? Thank you, sir. Um, progressives are calling for primary calendars for some of these moderates that aren't on board with things like voting rights, things like eliminating the filibuster in the Senate. What do you say to Democrats who are elected officials in office that are being called to be primary? Well, I think right now my focus uh, and the focus of many members of the House Democratic Caucus is just making the case for why every single senator, Democratic and Republican uh, senators, should support voting rights, should support the John Robert Lewis uh, Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Joe Manson Freedom to Vote Act. And hopefully, uh, my colleagues in the Senate who are talking directly to their colleagues in the Senate Democratic Caucus will be able to be successful in prevailing upon them that a rules change is necessary. Respect the Constitution, not senatorial custom. The, 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 set, the, the Constitution is pretty clear. The framers of the Constitution understood the word supermajority. These are highly enlightened, educated individuals. They understood that word. They put it in the Constitution four times four times to amend the Constitution and pass a constitutional amendment, supermajority. Ratify a treaty, supermajority. Override a presidential veto, supermajority. Convict the president who's been impeached by the House, supermajority. Pass legislation to impact the American people, simple majority. This is not really complicated, folks. This is a Senate custom that was birthed by Jim Crow segregationists. So I think the most productive thing that we can do right now is keep the focus on making the substantive arguments because we have a strong substantive case to be made. And let's leave the politics for another day. Let's we'll switch sides. If those appeals to Senators Manchin and Cinema are unsuccessful and they vote against these rules changes, what should the next steps be? Where should congressional Democrats go from there? Well, let's you know, let the process play itself out uh, over the next day or so. I've got great confidence 
and Leader Schumer, uh, as well as my colleagues, particularly Senator Warnock and Senator Booker, uh, and those colleagues who are close to Senators Manchin and Sinema, who are continuing to talk to them about finding a way to lift up voting rights in America. What, what specific action has the Biden administration and Democrats taken over the past year um, that you think are the most meaningful to American lives? Well, President, President Biden um, has had a very good year under incredibly difficult circumstances. 6.4 million good paying jobs have been created during Joe Biden's first year. That's a presidential record. The American Rescue Plan was passed. It saved state and local governments in blue states and red states all across America. That means that public health, public safety, public education, public transportation, public housing, and the provision of the public good all across America rescued because of President Biden's leadership. When President Biden took office, there were two million Americans fully vaccinated. One year later, 200 million Americans plus who are fully vaccinated. The American Rescue Plan contained the historic child tax credit, a massive tax cut for families with children that lifted almost half of American children who were in poverty out of poverty. The American Rescue Plan stood up a public health infrastructure that has enabled us to deal with the variants that we've seen over the last year, including Delta and now Omicron, with far less deaths than we would have otherwise experienced. We got into the Paris Climate Accord that Donald Trump had recklessly exited. And we passed, because of President Biden's leadership, a bipartisan infrastructure agreement that will create millions of good paying jobs moving forward in urban America, rural America, suburban America, small town America, and Appalachia by fixing our crumbling bridges, roads, tunnels, airports, water and sewage system, mass transportation systems. For the last several years, prior to President Biden's leadership, we had infrastructure week every other week and nothing ever happened. But under President Biden's leadership, America will now have a first class infrastructure for the 21st century. Let's put some respect on Joe Biden's name, President Biden has had a very good first year under very difficult circumstances. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the um, reforming the Electoral Count Act. We've heard members, uh, Democrats in both chambers, including leadership, um, kind of dismiss it as maybe insufficient or, or not important. But given what the January 6th committee has found that they're made public has been coordination or at least communication between some Republican members in the House and Mark Meadows about finding ways to maybe get around the certification, why would this not be an important step uh, to try to make sure that something like that doesn't happen in the future? I think it is important, but I'm going to yield to our resident expert on the January 6th committee. No, I haven't heard anyone say that it isn't important. Uh, what we've said is it's no substitute uh, for dealing with voting rights, which is what we are focused on this week. Uh, there will be a time and a place uh, to address the Electoral Count Act. Uh, there are bipartisan groups um, uh, in the in the Senate, uh, and I believe even in the House, who are having substantive conversations about this. But this is also an item that could be a recommendation out of the January 6th committee. Um, our responsibility is to develop legislative uh, fixes uh, to prevent this from happening in the future. If we feel that this is something that needs to be addressed, uh, then we will include this. Um, but that, that is, doesn't get in the way of substantive conversations um, uh, for po addressing the policy of this in the short term. What this means is um, for this week, uh, this should not be the focus. And we should not, be, we should not give our Republican colleagues an out 
um, to let them say that they've solved these issues um, of voting rights by dealing only with the Electoral Count Act. Can I follow up? Sure. Are you suggesting that there may not be action on this until recommendations come forward from the January 6th committee? No, I'm saying it could be in addition to. I'm saying that the recommendations from the January 6th uh, committee can be uh, in addition to uh, items that are addressed legislatively between now and then. Uh, we're not closing those doors. There are substantive conversations that happen um, uh, every day here. And so uh, let's, let's give those some space. Um, uh, and we don't have anything negative uh, to say about the Electoral Count Act and those discussions that are underway. Um, but again, this, this can't be uh, the first thing that we that we do um, instead of voting rights. Voting rights is the bedrock of what we need to accomplish. Um, but clearly, there were some deficiencies within the Electoral Count Act, and to the extent we can fix those legislatively, we should. Hi. Um, now that Build Back Better is sort of stalled, what are Democrats, House Democrats doing now to address inflation? Well, it's my expectation that we are going to revisit in short order the Build Back Better Act in the context of making sure that we can lower child care costs, lower health care costs, lower the high cost of life-saving prescription drugs, lower housing costs, and lower energy costs, all of which the Build Back Better Act will do. And these are all provisions that, by and large, Senator Joe Manchin supports. Uh, it's my expectation uh, that as soon as this voting rights uh, issue is resolved, hopefully favorably, hopefully in the next day or so. But if it's not, we'll always live to fight another day in defense of our democracy, inspired to do so by John Lewis and others, Dr. King, uh, and their spirits. But I do believe uh, that the Senate, in short order, uh, will revisit the Build Back Better Act, and we're going to be able to get something over the finish line in terms of addressing inflation. Today, uh, the Judiciary Subcommittee on Antitrust is holding a hearing uh, on some of the issues in terms of market power and consolidation related to uh, the food industry and meat processors and the dynamics that exist there, because we do believe there's a lot of pandemic price gouging that has taken place that we, under the leadership of Chairman David Cicilline, will begin to expose and elevate today. Go to the back. Yeah, who hasn't spoken yet, then we'll circle back. Uh, there's an increasing number of progressive primary challengers for House Democrats who um, these candidates see as out of step with the Democratic Party, more moderate members. Um, is this a sign that the party is no longer a big tent party and there's a competition between ideologies? Or can you respond to that? Well, House Democrats, we're not a cult. We're a coalition. We're a coalition uh, of a variety of different people all across the country, that's progressives, that's new Dems, that's blue dogs, all points in between. And primaries are part of the democratic process. And the House at the end of the day is about renewal. I expect that every incumbent is going to aggressively defend their records. And at the end of the day, uh, make the strongest possible case that they can, myself and Pete included, in our own respective races, as to why we should have our two-year employment contract renewed I don't think primary challenges are a sign of any dysfunction. It's a sign of democracy working. I uh, wanted to ask you again about stocks. Uh, last week, you, you said that um, you hadn't had a chance to take a look at any specific, specific proposals. But you know we had a couple bills come out last week. Um, Congresswoman An Angie Craig says that she wants to start the conversation about why leadership is against this. So I wanted to get your take just kind of norm normatively. Like, who who in leadership is against this? Huh? Uh, Speaker Pelosi. Okay. Um, I wanted to get your take on this. Like, normatively speaking, do you see something like a blind trust or just kind of a ban on trading individual stocks while in office as something I appreciate that your enthusiasm on this issue, but let me try to be as clear as I can be. As the chair of the House Democratic Caucus, I don't get out ahead of members when there are ongoing discussions about how to deal with issues of importance to them. We've got multiple bills that have been introduced by a variety of different members that are going to be before the committees of jurisdiction. None of those members has talked to me yet about their perspectives as to why their bill or this issue should move forward. 
Is it an important issue? Yes. Is it an issue that I'm going to comment on ahead of these members? No. Other than to say, my own view speaks for itself. My financial disclosure statements are publicly available. I do not own individual stocks, nor do I intend to own individual stocks. Beyond that, I'm not getting out ahead of any members. I want to follow up on Pete. Um, what I'll also say, I, I also don't own individual stocks um, and don't and don't plan to, just like the chairman. Um, but what I will say is, you know, we're going to allow this process um, to move forward. These members are going to be able to make their case to committees of jurisdiction. Uh, leadership has said that they want the House Administration Committee, of which I serve on, uh, to revisit this issue. Upholding the public trust is the number one thing that we want to do when we think about this issue. We want to make sure that people understand we're doing this for the right reason. Um, and so to the extent we need to make changes to the Stock Act or increase penalties or ensure compliant, further compliance with the Stock Act, we're not going to hesitate to do that. What we aren't going to do is to be lectured on this issue by someone who coddled the twice impeached president and has his own ethical, had his own ethical issues, the former president had his own ethical issues related to disclosures. So we're not going to be lectured to by that individual, but we're going to be open to legislative solutions if it ensures compliance. I have a follow-up on that. Let me just say on that. Some of these people on the other side of the aisle, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, for, for raising this. I mean, they, they consistently, consistently bent the knee and supported the most corrupt president in American history across the board. And I don't want to lecture the Congress about how to proceed when there's a process in place. Brilliant members are putting forth different pieces of legislation. Like, we're going to handle this in a thoughtful, evidence-based fashion and come to a conclusion at the end of the day in the manner that the vice chair laid out. But these people lecturing us, I mean, the grifter in chief is someone who they supported lock, stock, and barrel, and still do as loyal members of the cult. Back better. You had mentioned your anticipation is that after the voting rights debate is and the vote is done, that you guys will get something across the finish line. Do you mean to imply that you guys are looking at a smaller, like scaling back the Build Back Better bill? No, no, I mean to imply that I expect conversations will continue, as I believe the administration has indicated, uh, with Senator Manchin and other senators on the other side of the Capitol to try to get important parts of the Build Back Better Act, if not the entire thing, over the finish line. Someone We're coming up on a year of President Biden's time in office. Can you just reflect on this past year, things that Democrats can do better into the second year of President Biden's term and, and things that you think that he could possibly improve on? Pete, you want to address that? Sure. I thought the chairman laid out earlier uh, the, the pieces that we are proud of in the past 364 days, the American Rescue Plan, um, entering the, the uh, re-entering the Paris Climate Accord, uh, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Improvement and Jobs Act. Uh, those are landmark pieces of legislation that on its own, if someone said that they accomplished those, would be incredibly noteworthy and historic. Um, moving forward, we, we know that there are high expectations to govern. We accept that. Um, we want to develop policy that improves the lives of the American people. That's what we're focused on in year two. While the other side can talk about, every, uh, can talk about nothing, um, they haven't talked about a substantive issue. The Republican Party hasn't talked about a substantive issue that they genuinely believe in and that they want to govern on in the future. We've talked about reducing the cost of prescription drugs, life-saving medication for individuals. We've talked about the child tax credit and taking half of the children in this country out of poverty. 
those are the North Stars. Those are the pieces, the policy pieces that we feel we have solutions to address in year two of the Biden administration, working with the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, so that's what we want to accomplish. Um, now, we're all going to talk about process. We're all going to talk about who's up and who's down, what the Senate thinks. Um, uh, all of those pieces are fair game under this dome. But when we go home uh, and we get on planes and trains and automobiles to get home each and every week, um, we hear from our constituents. Uh, that's what's special about this place. That's what's special about the house. And we hear their struggles. We hear that they're struggling to get through the pandemic, that while the economy is improving, um, who are we leaving behind? Um, and the uncertainty uh, that, that people face uh, in their daily lives. Those are the things that we want to address. Those are the things that we want to help with. Um, and when people go uh, to that ballot box, you know, we know that, that it's, it's about us in our, in our districts uh, and whether we have helped them. Um, and so, you know, we want to make our case to the American people that we have um, over this time period um, done uh, sufficient things to help improve their daily lives. That's what that's what this is about. That's why we come here every day. Thank you for that question. It's also uh, my expectation, in addition to as Vice Chair Aguilar has laid out, that we're going to continue to work on these incredibly important issues, that this will be a year of drawing contrasts. Democrats deliver for the people. The Republicans are the party of no, the party of nonsense, the party of getting nothing done. We've already accomplished historic things and will continue to do so as part of the Democratic effort to create millions of good paying jobs, increase pay for everyday Americans, as well as lower costs in a variety of different areas, including health care, education, housing, and energy costs. We'll keep our focus on delivering for the American people, but also not let the Republicans off the hook because of their incompetence, their inaction, as well as their continued adherence to a failed cult leader. Last two questions. We'll go here and then last question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, you say how you're trying to make the contrast that Democrats are the party that delivers. A lot of members are, what we're hearing, is pretty anxious that they haven't delivered yet on Build Back Better. I know some House members bring up to leadership that they you know, may want to pass bills individually to see what the Senate can package up. Progressives looking at maybe pushing Biden on executive orders on Build Back Better. What is leadership's position on this? How are you trying to quell those anxieties as you continue to move forward these next 10 months to Election Day? Well, House Democrats have delivered in each and every area, and it's my expectation that we'll be able to find a pathway forward with the Senate on Build Back Better and certainly, hopefully, on voting rights. Uh, but I think it's important to remember, as Dr. King just reminded us as we reflected upon uh, his life and his legacy a few days ago, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. We think what Dr. King was saying to us is that in this world, there's some good folks, there's some rough folks. For the good folks to be able to prevail, you've got to be willing to continue to stand up, step up, speak up, show up. And things aren't necessarily going to happen instantaneously. It didn't for Dr. King. It didn't for Rosa Parks. It didn't for Fannie Lou Hamer or John Lewis, or A. Philip Randolph, or Roy Wilkins, or Adam Clayton Powell Jr., or Shirley Chisholm, and we're inspired, Hugo Chavez, Cesar Chavez, we're, we're inspired by all of these leaders, their struggles, their civil rights struggles, the farm worker struggle, the women's struggle. And, you know, it's my expectation uh, that the people that we represent understand this dynamic of struggle and service and sacrifice, and that we'll be able to make the case that we're going to continue to do everything we can on economic justice, on racial justice, and on social justice. Last question. Um, I just wanted to ask, rounding out almost two years since the start of the pandemic, is your caucus talking about doing anything else in terms of coronavirus relief? We haven't had that caucus discussion uh, yet, 
but certainly there are beginning to be some hopeful signs that this current variant in places like New York City and Washington, D.C., the numbers are decreasing. I think we are encouraged by the fact that while the transmissibility of this particular variant uh, is strong, uh, the lethality of it uh, is much less severe, in part because the President and his administration has done a good job of taking that number of fully vaccinated Americans from 2 million a year ago to over 200 million today. Will we continue to encourage um, responsible behavior, vaccinations, boosters, masking up, the availability of at-home tests, which the administration has leaned into? Uh, yes, we haven't had a specific discussion. We look forward to hearing what the President has to say when he delivers the State of the Union address on March 1st. Thank you, everyone. Testing one, two, three, testing, testing one, two.